Good morning, YouTube. Uh, another day, another video. Um, but yeah, so this week's a little bit special. We're doing two chapters of Kageyama. Um, so I don't know if y'all have been about it, but uh, we've already posted chapter four of Fundamentals of Go, and the video is on my YouTube channel. Uh, so following suit, chronologically speaking, we will be doing chapter five and the interlude today. Um, so it's about territory and spheres of influence and um, you know for those who see a framework and are like oh no that's gonna be my opponent's territory and I can't do anything about it what should I do uh, this chapter is for you um, but with that yeah buckle in strap in and enjoy the show chapter 5 territory and spheres of influence while reading a newspaper the other day I came upon a three column article entitled which literally means fundamental forms of flavoring don't be a non-conformist but tsuke, aji, and katachi are also go terms I started to read under the impression that it would be about go but I was wrong the article dealt with techniques of Japanese cooking such as the flavoring of clear and bean paste soups my attention had been caught however so I read on the gist of it was that there are basic fixed percentages of bean paste and salt to put into soup stock. I used to make bean paste soup myself during my bachelor existence, but far from following fixed percentages, I made it without preparing any stock at all. No wonder it never turned out well. Once again, I was impressed by the importance of fundamentals in all areas. Territory and spheres of influence Inability to distinguish between them is one of the weaknesses of amateur go. Diagram 1. White 1 to 9 might appear in the opening. It seems to be very different. Ah, it seems to be very difficult to make a correct assessment of this in similar opening positions. White will probably get 40 or 50 points of territory on the upper side, say some. If they're playing black, then they already feel overwhelmed at this early stage of the game. It is no surprise to see them go on to lose. The correct view is that the upper side is white's sphere of influence and nothing more. It cannot be called territory. What about black? He may count 10 points or so of territory in the upper right corner, but the left side, although it is his sphere of influence, is not his territory yet at all. One must learn to view the board with detachment. Diagram 2. Black has X teen points of territory in the upper left corner. He has a sphere of influence in the lower left corner. White has a sphere of influence on the left side. What? Even this isn't territory? That's right. Black can still invade an A, white B, black C, etc. up to black I and get a co for instance. Diagram 3. What is the reader's view of this opening position? Do I hear him muttering, 10 or 20 points for white on the upper side, 20 or 30 for black on the right side, and about 15 for him on the left side. Do I hear him adding that he may not be a go wizard, but at least he knows how to count? It's surprising how many people do not realize that to count territory when the stones are as sparsely scattered as this is fundamentally impossible. A showdown opponent in a seven stone game once amazed me by counting the territories, ticking them off with nods of his head before 20 moves have been played in the opening. Even head-shaking Kano, as Kano Nindon is sometimes called, does not start his head-shaking in the opening. He only does it in the endgame, and at that when he's ahead, as a way of unnerving his opponent. <laughs> the correct view of Diagram 3 is that both black and white have only spheres of influence, which must not be considered territory. In a handicap game, however, white can hardly avoid thinking of uh, thinking in terms of getting more territory than he has a right to expect. While Black never knows what his opponent, who's let's say 5 or 6 stones stronger, will do to him. Diagram 4. Black's territory quickly comes apart when White plays 1, or some other standard move. Given the right time and circumstances, White can easily change, charge right into the middle of Black's position at A or B and get away with it. In the upper left corner, he can reduce Black's territory to nothing with C, etc. In fact, the idea of the upper left corner 
becoming white's territory is not to be left at. The right side is not black's territory. The upper left corner may not be white's territory, that would be too much of an assumption to make. But the point is that it takes a great deal of work to surround territory and secure it as your own. If black can complete his encirclement with A before white plays 1, he may then have territory, but white can still invade with the feeling that if he gets killed, he hasn't lost anything, while if he lives, he has a windfall. What about that, Mr. Black? Diagram 5 For the benefit of those who wonder if white's invasion at 1 is not a bit reckless, black usually has no better way to meet it than with the natural reply at 2. White's attachment at 3 is the common decigy. Alright then, black is happy to defend with 4 and 6. Now he can count territory in the upper right. Certainly, but don't just look at black's position. We can't ignore the fact that white's upper, p upper side position has been made much stronger by 3 and 5. Diagram 6. What if black blocks from this side with 4? Then white can live easily with 5 to 9. Note black 10. Most people do not re seem to realize what an important stone it is. Now for a question. From the starting position in Diagram 3, which do you think is the better development for black? Diagram 5 or Diagram 6? The answer. Diagram 6 is better. Suppress that guilty gasp of surprise. The difference between white's thickness, diagram 5, and thinness, diagram 6, on the upper side is worth more profit or loss than in the corner. Bear in mind, however, that if white's upper side position were already a little stronger, diagram 5 would be better for black. There is no rule that says diagram 6 is always best. Diagram 7. Black would prefer to ignore white 1. And if he answers it, he should block at 3. Instead, he has fallen to 2, then followed backwards again at 4. How humiliating. Yet, this is practically the same as Diagram 5. This way of looking at the moves in a different order provides part of the irony of Go. Diagram 8. Black makes a 1 space pincer at 1, white jumps out to 2, and black plays 3. If this black 3 strikes you as excellent, the only move, you have the right idea. The man who said, Not so, I saw a game in a newspaper where so and so 9 Don made a 2 space extension to A instead of 3, was expelled from the Kageyama school of Go. From the standpoint of struggling to get ahead, for example, black 3 is just perfect. The pincer attack at white 8 is not really worth the expan expense of playing white 4 and 6. After being given so much, black will, happy, well, black will be happy to let white have black 1. Diagram 9. He will play 1 and 3. Professionals do not make pushing moves like white's triangle stones, except perhaps when they have to avoid being captured, or when they have a stone out towards A that will stop black's advance. I may have said that secure territory rarely happens in the opening, but there are exceptions. In this case, where black extends step by step along the fourth line is one of them. The basic reason of the triangle moves are wrong is that they give black definite position of the secure territory. They force him along the fourth line, the so-called line of victory. What should white have done in diagram 8 was to play 4 at 7 or immediately at 8. S. Tudon you were right, Kageyama, when you said that against a stronger opponent, white's territories look bigger, while black's territories look smaller, or at least black doesn't have any confidence in them. Diagram 10, for example, may be a good opening for both sides, but white will invade black's position at A, B, or C, and so on. Black knows he can enter the lower side at D and E, but he also knows from experience that he'll be in for trouble if he does because white is stronger. Taking this difference in strength into consideration, I'd like to know what black should do about white's fear of influence. Uh, some players might be quite unimpressed by large frameworks, but most like most probably feel as S does. If you dislike large enemy frameworks, then forget about the usual opening strategy of cloner, enclosure, corner, approach, and then extension along the side. Never mind what others say. The best opening is one you yourself find easiest to handle. 
If you have trouble dealing with the white sandense, then quick invade the lower side with black 5 in diagram 11 and prevent trouble before it happens. Use your imagination. If your games go sour from the opening, you may as well not play. Furthermore, if white invades black's sphere of influence at A, B, or C in diagram 10, he offers a sitting target for attack. Black should rejoice. It is only as if he is counting those places as his territory that his calculations are upset, his temper flares, his composure departs, and he rushes headlong towards a mighty failure. If you worry that much about your spheres of influence, then play an opening in which you don't make any spheres of influence. Go is supposed to be enjoyable, so find openings that fit your own style and learn to enjoy it yourself at it. Spheres of influence and territory? What is so important about spheres of influence in the opening? Without my wasting words, look at diagrams 12 and 13. If black plays as tightly as in those, these two diagrams, his areas can be considered territory. White has spheres of influence which cannot be counted as territory at all, but even a beginner would agree that white's opening is good and black's is bad. I certainly do not mean, however, that it is always good to construct large spheres of influence. Diagram 14. In view of this strong black position in the upper right, for instance, white is correct in holding himself to one. If he tries to establish a larger sphere of influence with A instead, he invites a lightning black invasion at B, which will cause him plenty of grief. White A ignores the golden rule about not approaching enemy thickness, and to those who think that after white won it is good for black to extend to A, or one line lower, and expand his right side territory, I offer another golden rule, don't use thickness to surround territory. Diagram 15. This is part of a game between two amateur three dons. White extended to one and black capped him at two. Waited for black white three, then probed his defenses with four. As I was watching all this, black asked me, What about these moves, Kageyama? I'm starting to climb out of the amateur rut, aren't I? I thought he must be joking, but when I looked at his face, he seemed perfectly serious. Black has lots of amateur company in thinking that the capping play and 3-3 three, three, three attachment against the corner enclosure are professional moves, but they are mere imitations of professional moves, played without any understanding. The most important thing to learn from professionals is not where they play, but why they play there. Diagram 16. White's markstone came too close to Black's stronghold above to begin with. It should have been held back to A in this situation. Since White had gone too far, Black should have invaded immediately at 1 and punished him for his mistake. The principle is exactly the same with his white A, black B, in diagram 14. You're three dons and don't understand any of this? I asked sharply of black and his opponent. <laughs> if black were to play first instead of white, he should extend all the way to 1 in diagram 16. Diagram 17. This is an even game at the end of the opening. Black has placed overall stress on thick outer influence while white is countering with actual profit at the expense of a little thinness. As far as the balance of territories goes, white has a fair amount of perspective territory in several places, while black's only perspective territory is about 20 points in the lower right. Perhaps most people would conclude that black's opening is bad. Amateurs, who are Poor at making use of outer walls, tend to have trouble playing this kind of opening, because black is weak in territory. I would like to give two or three examples, starting with this one, of games in which black has superior thickness and explain the strategy he should follow in the middle game. Black to play. How should he proceed? Diagram 18. Bad strategy. Most amateurs would employ the following strategy. They would use the solid black wall in the lower left to embark on a project to surround territory in the center by holding white down at 1 and capping him at 3 and 5. Assume white 6 to 20 and try estimating the score. Black has had the thing just about the way he wanted, but he is behind in the balance of territory. White is a fairly clear lead on the board, not counting any Komi. Diagram 19 Good strategy. 
Black should search out white's thin spots. There are not any to be found in the lower left or the lower right. That leaves black only black 1 on the upper side. Black 1, however, is such a good move that it is practically absolute. White 2 is a rather nice defense, but black settles himself quickly and in good style with 3 to 9. Besides settling himself, he has an eye on the white group in the upper left. Now, the balance of territory is more even, and black's overall thickness should see to the rest. One cannot expect to turn thickness directly into territory. The correct strategy is to have it stare down at the enemy, silent and threatening. Black 1 at A would be another damaging invasion. Diagram 20, a 4 stone game. Black to play. Where? He has built that beautiful outer wall on the upper side by pushing straight forward from the attach and extend joseki in the upper right corner. White has just turned at the mark stone, the triangle stone, since he does not want to be forced to defend by having black play there. Now the most natural thing in the world, in most circumstances, would be for black to answer at A or B, but if he does not rid himself of this habit of answering, he cannot hope to make progress. Even if he ignores white's triangle stone, does white have any outstanding follow-up move? Cannot black find a better move elsewhere? This is his perfect opportunity to take the initiative in the game. He must not let it slip. Diagram 21. Bad strategy. Black 1 is terrible. Again, black is trying to use his outer wall as a base from which to surround territory. The way the fighting after White's invasion of the right side at 6 goes is not fixed, but since Black's aim was to surround the center, he will probably be gloating over the result up to 19. When White makes the shallow reducing move at 22, Black stops him and completes his territory with 23. The middle game is going just as he wanted. An unbiased estimate of the score reveals how bad Black's strategy is. He has 30 plus points in the center and about 30 in other places for a total of 60 plus. White's territories also add up to 60 plus. The balance of power is 50-50. Somehow, in spite of Black's having had his own way, he has already lost his handicap advantage. He has lost the game. Diagram 22. Winning strategy. White's only thinness is on the left side. Black's best policy is to strike there by invading in 1. Not just any invasion will do. In particular, if he plays 1 at A, then white 1, black B, and white will crosscut at 13, a tesuji for down dodging around black's attacks, so some care is necessary. If white answers black 1 with 2, black attacks him wholeheartedly up to 13 then. Seeing his opportunity, detonates a bomb at 15 inside the white group below. White is going to have his hands full answering that. Black's outer walls and outward power really come to life now. White's plight is so bad that I would like to know myself what he is supposed to do next. This is the way for Black to make use of his outward influence. Diagram 23. An even game. Black to play. Where? We are between the opening and the middle game and White with all four corners, has a definite lead in territory. This is what the ancients mean when they said, if you lose all four corners, resign. Actually, when one side has given up all four corners, he usually has a good, thick game. <laughs> the only reason he loses is that he does not know how to use his outer walls. Given black to play in this position, a glance suffices to tell that he has the upper hand. If he takes the wrong course with his next move, however, White will quickly be able to neutralize his outer influence and make him contest the issue on the basis of territory. Well, Black, what will you do? Attack the rootless, naked white stones on the right side, or do you- Diagram 24. Unfavorable. First of all, Black has to play 1 and 3 to keep White from linking up. That seems obvious. It is wrong, however. This kind of resourceless splitting strategy has no place in the game. White goes loping ahead with 2 and 4 while Black and 1 and 3 occupy worthless points. By now, Black has no hope of attacking White. Black 5 to 11 take a nice profit in the upper left corner, but once White defends at 12, it is not going to be easy to beat him. Black 1 and 3 are wrong. Do they look natural to you? 
then you will have to reverse your thought processes 180 degrees if you ever want to play correctly. Diagram 25. Winning strategy. First of all, you have to be able to find black 1. White defends skillfully with 2 to 10, but then you confront him head on and, like the dauntless Matabe Goto, refuse to budge a step. White runs towards the top with 14 and 18, and you make no futile efforts to cut him off, because he is only running away, not taking any profit at all. As he plays all his stones on neutral points, you seal off the center with 11, 15, and 17, and, lo and behold, you have yourself a magnificent outside wall. Next comes the long-awaited raid into the upper left corner. With black 25, the game is as good as one. Black has thickness and more territory as well. He could not have run a better race. Diagram 26. In this type of position, white cannot afford to let black approach at A. If it is his turn, he has to make the two-space extension to one. This is common sense. The player who would not extend to one does not exist. Diagram 27. This time, the common sense two-space extension to A would be like banging one's head against black strong wall. One has to develop the instinct to not play like that. White should defend himself with the knight's move at 1, or with an extension in the other direction to B. There is a brooding menace in black's thickness in the upper left, and the two space extensions are not automatically correct. Interlude Lecturing on NHK Television NHK TV fills the gaps between annual runnings of the NHK Cup tournament with lectures on Go on Sunday at noon. <laughs> Recently, these have been doing rather well. The viewer rating, which used to be a fraction of a percent, has climbed to 1.5%, and two or three thousand solutions to the life and death problems are sent in each time. A viewer rating of 1% on the NHK is considered to represent 700,000 households, so each lecture is watched by over a million people. The first 15 minutes of a lecture are a basic elementary corner, and the lecturer who took over this part of the program in April 1969, T. Kageyama, drew favorable comment for the clarity and usefulness of what he said. The television production director had a theory to account for his popularity. It must mean because he, having, an actual am having been an actual amateur himself, Kageyama knows what it's like to face a stronger opponent, so he can explain things from the amateur point of view. This line appeared in a five-column article about me, complete with a photograph, in the television guide section of a newspaper. Now that my highly successful, if I may say so, stint as a lecturer is over, I would like to write a bit about it. When I was given the elementary corner, I felt right at home. Already, for upward of ten years at the Central Hall and other places, I had been mounting the stand, microphone in hand, before audiences of beginners, so I thought I had the rules and elements down pat. At least, I was not concerned about falling victim to stage fright, but when the time came, things were a little different. Before the unblinking stare of a dozen large camera lenses that were sending their signals over the length and breadth of the country, I lost control. My heart pounded, my throat dried up, my voice boomed in the silence of the crucial scene, and, to make matters worse, there had been the countdown. One minute to go, 30 seconds. 10 seconds start how can anyone keep his composure after that i had a full-blown case of stage fright normally i don't phase easily the counting off of seconds during a game never bothers me but this countdown had me going out of my mind i went through the short 15 minute time in such a state that afterward i could not recall the thing i had said and just when i was beginning to get warmed up it was Three minutes to go. Two minutes to go. Between wondering how to bring the lecture to a close and trying not to rush, I was at my wit's end. At least I had done my best. The next couple of sessions were similar ordeals. As the people at the studio had said, however, after I became accustomed to the conditions, they graduated, gradually ceased to bother me. Once the course got off the ground and my usual fine form returned, I even began to enjoy those television appearances. 
One thing that helped me make a rapid adjustment was seeing Okubu Nindon, the lecturer for the intermediate class, stiffen up too. Knowing exactly what he was going through enabled me to relax. Okubu, Okubo and I took turns submitting the life and death problems. This being a television show, the easier the problems, the greater the number of responses. It was a bit upsetting to receive fewer than 500 cards, a steep drop, as I did when I set up the problem shown in diagram 1, black to play and live. The answer is shown in diagram 2. White captures three stones with four and connects one point below black one with six. If he fails to connect, black can cut there. Black lives with seven. I had not thought of this as an advanced problem, though just a bit on the hard side because of the non-obvious under the stones play. But I seem to have misjudged it. The fact that the number of replies went back up to the two or three thousand level when I avoided any more such difficult problems made that fairly clear. What the divisor of problems had to pay heed to even more than making them easy to solve was making them easy to remember on sight. Simplicity was desirable. Diagram 3, white play to live, for example. Answer white A. The idea was to produce a position the viewer could copy down in a short space of time. Only two minutes of air time were allotted for the solutions of the life and death problems. Once or twice, I slipped somewhere in going through the, make, going through the variations, and, I even, and even if I caught my mistake immediately, before I had time to correct it, cut, the lecture was over. What hurt afterward were the gently chiding letters from sharp-eyed viewers. To answer all of them was a time-consuming task, but I did not want to be accused of evading a question. Some of the writers forgot that the subject was life and death and demanded to know why such and such was not the correct answer because they gave one more point of profit. <laughs> Notwithstanding all the trouble I went in to composing unequivocal answers, no one ever sent me a word of thanks in reply. Can I be blamed for sometimes getting fed up? Such is the price of fame, however, so I'm not going to complain. Just what Q level to address myself to was always a difficult question. This was supposed to be an elementary course, but Kawaii, the first announcer I worked with, played as a 3Q, and the program came to rest at his level. I kept wondering if we were not going to lose our audience by going over their heads, but in spite of the level tended to get higher and higher. Since I happened to be a 10Q shogi player, I tried putting myself in my viewer's place by watching the elementary shogi lectures of Sekine Eitan. His discussion of the way to use pawns was like a sermon from the clouds to me. I met Sekine in, at the studio frequently, so I took the liberty of asking him once if he couldn't bring his lectures down to a much lower level, and this he did. The way to use rooks was intelligible even to a beginner like me, and I began to enjoy the shogi lectures. At time, at times, you should post your rook as far away as possible, and the reason being that the farther it is away from enemy's pieces, the more ranks and files are open to it. This was reasoning that I could understand. This had great effect on my go lectures. I too began to give basic advice, backed up by reasoned arguments, explaining everything thoroughly in an exaggerated voice down to the last stone, adding gestures and bodily movements, stressing and repeating the important parts, until I was sure that even a complete duffer could understand me. Each time I would tell myself, it doesn't matter if the stronger viewers drop out, this, pro this program isn't for them. But oddly enough, even stronger players seem extremely interested in my elementary advice. Wherever I went, I was told how interesting my lectures were. I was gaining confidence, and Kawaii and I had gotten perfectly in step with each other, when disaster struck. Kawaii was transferred to Shikoku, and his place in the lineup was taken up by an announcer named Mikami a real, be real beginner who hardly knew what Atari meant, let alone any more technical terms. The questions he asked were completely off base, and if we rehearsed beforehand, he promptly forgot everything he was supposed to say during the show itself, as was only to be expected. <laughs> we had a serious communication gap. Oh dear, I thought to myself, and the production director even suggested that I do the lectures by myself, but Mikami, in a real dis rare display of energy, took time from his busy schedule, or rather, made it a part of his bu busy schedule, to attend the first beginner's course at a central hall, then the intermediate course, and so on, 
and went out of his way to create opportunities to talk with me. Gradually, we became a better combination. He played a kind of gestures role. <laughs> After this, I thoroughly enjoyed myself in videotaping sessions. I have many pleasant memories associated with the choose the next move program problems that were presented to the guest on each show. My masterpiece was the one in Diagram 4, which I sent for a professional comic storyteller named Ennaku. Black A is the correct answer, and the fact that he guessed it gives you an idea of his strength. What made me choose this problem was that Black A is the so-called horse head move, and Ennaku has a long, narrow head. The name Horsehead comes from picturing the mark stones as the two eyes and black A as the nose. If you picture this image, you should be able to play the move easily, Dakuni. And this was the start of a whole series of untranslatable puns on the name of my guest that left him helpless. Looking back on that year's experience, I am sure that the person who enjoyed it more than any viewer, more than anyone else, was me. So there we have it, YouTube. We've read another 20 odd pages together. Chapter 5 and the interlude has finally come to an end. And in the end of it, we even saw like uh, a bit of a preview of the next chapter of Tsumego, Life and Death, right? So, yeah, look forward to that next week. Um, and I cap hope to catch you back here next Monday. Um, or, you know, even better, live. So come check us out live at twitch.tv slash See you later, YouTube.